Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Complete Human Podcast with your hosts, Jana Breslin and Evan DeMarco. In 1819, Mary Shelley wrote about reanimating a human body with chemicals and electricity, long before PEMF became a therapy. And long before David Hasselhoff was running up and down the beach in Baywatch, he was driving around in a talking car he called Kit. At the time, the idea of a talking car that could drive itself was far beyond the realm of possibility. Today, we simply call that a Tesla. 1990 saw the introduction of Michael Crichton's book, Jurassic Park, a cautionary tale about the awesome power of genetic engineering. The story captured the minds of science fiction fans the world over, but it wasn't until the launch of Jurassic Park the movie that the general population understood the true power of what Engine was doing on that island off of Costa Rica. Genetic engineering is no longer science fiction. It is here, and it is going to have an impact on the future. Quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? Science fiction, for the most part, allows the dreamers of a generation to visualize what the future will look like, and then apply the very real consequences of the choices we make as a species to a fictional story. In many ways, science fiction acts as a global cautionary tale, a giant neon sign saying, Danger Will Robinson. Danger Will Robinson. Danger No Will Robinson. Our next guest has made a career out of blending the unimaginable potential of technology with the very imaginable consequences of that technology. With a masterful hand, he guides us through the cosmic minefield of that technology with a patient approach to unifying humanity through education. As a science fiction and fiction writer, he understands the power of story in explaining the science of emerging tech and the consequences of that tech if not handled properly. Jamie Metzl is a technology and healthcare futurist, geopolitical expert, novelist, social entrepreneur, and the founder and chair of the global social movement One Shared World. In 2019, he was appointed to the World Health Organization's Expert Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing. Ladies and gentlemen, Jamie Metzl. I'm I'm pretty deeply involved in a few different areas. One is on the big question of what happens when revolutionary technologies fundamentally transform our lives. I'm author of the book, as you know, Hacking Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity. I'm a member of the World Health Organization International Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing, and I'm deeply involved in these big existential questions about where we're going, about the intersection of our humanity and values and ethics and, uh, and technology. I have another part of my life that for many, many decades have been, not so many decades, I hope, but um, have <laughs> been involved in, in uh, big uh, questions about how do we govern ourselves? Um, I uh, serve with the United Nations. I'm a former member of the US National Security Council. And I'm now the founder and chair of, of a uh, global movement or budding movement called One Shared World, which is ultimately trying to address and hopefully solve our world's collective action problem because we have all these big challenges like uh, global warming and ecosystem destruction and so many other things and pandemics. Um, and we're not organized to address them. Uh, and then finally, um, I'm a science fiction writer and novelist and um, Iron Man triathlete um, and human being. <laughs> Love that. So it, it's kind of funny, as, as I was reading your bio and really started looking at a lot of your work, I kept coming back to this idea that you really remind me of a modern day Carl Sagan. In well, thanks. You've got the scientific side, but you've also really got this humanity side. And, and I think time and time again, there seems to be this budding of heads with science and the humanity. And, and I think that you, you've done so much incredible work and we want to get into that. But I, I think there's so many questions we could ask you as it pertains to your work. So I want to get into some of the stuff that's really fundamental to where we're at right now. And that is from a technological perspective, are we going to survive the next 50 years? Well, we could. I hope we will. <laughs> <laughs> I certain, but but in the old days, um, we didn't have technologies that were as powerful as what we have now. So if somebody misused the bow and arrow or so many of those other technologies, which had massive implications in their day, uh, they they couldn't end human life on Earth or life on Earth. But now. We have these technologies, certainly nuclear uh, weaponry, biological weapons, um, and just the whole, these, the physics revolution, the chemistry revolution, the biology revolution, they give us these tools that don't come with their own built-in values and ethics systems. And so 
while we can use these tools to do miraculous, wonderful things to not just help humans live longer, healthier, more robust lives, but to save our planet, to save other species, to unlock uh, potentials, these same technologies can be abused that could lead to all kinds of catastrophic outcomes. And the difference between the good outcomes and the bad outcomes is us. And, and that's why these kinds of conversations about how do we apply our most cherished values to guide the applications of our most powerful technologies are so essential. I was, we were watching the Joe Rogan podcast earlier. And I remember um, in that you had, you were talking to some scientists in Kyoto and you'd ask them the two mm -hmm. questions. One was, you know, what are you working now? And where does that work get us in 50 years? And most of them couldn't answer that. Right. So is that a fundamental flaw in the scientific community that we're so scope locked on our ability to accomplish something that we don't actually perceive how it has an impact in the long-term goal of, of kind of the human race? Well, I guess the question is who does science and who is responsible for science? Certainly we have a subset of people who we call scientists and we train them. Uh, we ask them to select specific problems and in many cases to dedicate their entire lives to solving their, uh, those problems. Um, we haven't trained every scientist as an ethicist and we may not even want every scientist uh, to be spending half of their time on science and half of their time on ethics. But it's not just the scientists who are doing science. We are all collectively doing science. And that's why uh, everybody, that's why I do the work uh, that, uh, that I do, uh, everybody needs to be brought in to the process uh, of first, if we all need to understand where science and technology are taking us. And we all need to understand um, not just what are the big decisions that need to be made, we need to be part of the making of those decisions, because if, the, if we are organized in a way that the scientists do science and a small number of regulators or government officials decide what happens with the science, that certainly is a recipe for disaster. Well, and I think that the, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the FDA, just looking at the United States, and we can kind of scale that up to the WHO, but as we talk about things like stem cells or genetic modifications, a lot of the things that I, I know you've spoken about, the FDA seems to be so far behind just in the, bureau, you know, the bureaucratic nature of what it is that they're trying to do. So how does science, you know, how does science proceed at the rate that it's doing while these bureaucracies that are responsible for regulating some of this stuff have any hope of keeping up with the pace at which scientific innovation takes place? Yeah, that mismatch is, is almost built in because uh, if you had regulators that were getting ahead of the science, they wouldn't know how to, uh, to regulate. And so you have to have a little bit of, of scientific development and maturity to be able to figure out what, what the smartest types of regulations look like. The problem is that now we're dealing with exponentials in so many different areas. And so the technology is really racing forward at an incredible rate. Uh, and that's why um, we need to have much more dynamic processes. The science is accelerating, but the regulatory infrastructure around it isn't. Um, the popular understanding of what science is and how it works, that's in, in many parts of the world, that's not uh, advancing. And those kinds of mismatches are really dangerous and they're addressable. And, that, and that's why we just, we all have a lot of work to do. So what are your, uh, I guess, what do you advocate for when it comes to addressing that massive mismatch? Yeah, so first, everything has to be, at least in democracies, everything has to begin on a popular level. Uh, we need massive science education, not just so people can be informed, but so that they can be part of the process of developing norms that lead to different decisions and regulations and things like that. Um, secondly, we need to supercharge our regulatory agencies and we need to depoliticize them. When I compare what's happening here in, in the United States, where so much of our science has uh, been politicized, uh, whether it's around abortion or, or, or anything or other things, uh, there's no benefit. We are not better off uh, than in a country like the United Kingdom, uh, where they have all kinds of ethical safeguards, but it's done more on a, on a professional professional level. And we need to find that right balance. We don't want to have government decisions or regulatory decisions made um, that uh, don't take into account people's very legitimate concerns, including religious concerns. Um, but at the same time, we can't have kind of a chaos. Uh, we, we can't 
Um, we have to be able to have conversations about may, many life-saving technologies that come with challenges. Nothing in life is 100% free. And there are these kinds of trade-offs and mature societies make them, but that's the, the work that we need to do. So it has to start with a popular base. Uh, we need much more effective, depoliticized government and then we need to, make, to recognize that this is ongoing, that norms are changing, people's perceptions are changing, the science is, uh, is changing. We can't have one and done laws or, or regulations that we expect to last for 10 or, or, or 20 years because the science is racing forward so rapidly. Are we a mature society? In some ways we are, and in some ways we aren't. I mean, certainly here in the United States, uh, we have the, the you know, greatest science establishment um, in the world, and it's incredible. In terms of our political process, I think you know, every single person who's, who's been observing our politics over recent years would not use the word mature <laughs> to describe us. We have some of the best regulatory agencies. Uh, they're not perfect, but the FDA is, is a great regulatory agency full of people doing, uh, doing great work. So it's, it's mixed and we can't expect ourselves to be perfect, but we can expect ourselves um, to be on a process of always getting, getting better. And that's what's been so concerning these, these last years because it's, like, it's felt at least to me like our abilities as a government to solve problems, to, to fix shortcomings has deteriorated. And I'm hoping that will turn around. You know, we talk a lot about a lot about this, but I, I kind of feel that one of the biggest impediments to that kind of growth and our ability to to really fix some of these problems is boiled down to social media. We talk about tech, um, we just throw out random opinions, and, and and I think you know the current COVID vaccinations are a perfect example of that. It's this under you know people have no idea, or most people don't have any idea about the RNA versus the DNA and how, so everybody thinks is this is the government's way to sterilize the population and it's yeah. all, you know, genetic modification, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, I guess in that there's the question of how much does our evolving technology, especially when it comes to things like social media impact our ability to act as a mature society and have intelligent debate about these technologies and how they can positively impact our future. Yeah, well, it certainly hurts, um, but it also helps and, and can help. I mean, there's all kinds of misinformation floating around there. An average person who's getting something on their Twitter feed or, or somewhere else, they don't really have a built-in mechanism for evaluating what is coming from the greatest expert in the field and what's coming from some um, troll in a, in a Russian troll farm, especially mm -hmm. if, it all looks, if it all looks the same. Um, and certainly we've gone from our previous world, not so many decades ago, where so much information was filtered. We had uh, the information coming from the news and, uh, and in so many other areas was coming through filters and experts and others. And now we've had this, this small de-democratic revolution. And so people are getting so much uh, information. We're going to have to go back to some kind of system where we're able to ev collectively evaluate. We need some kind of, of filters because our brains aren't really designed to differentiate and uh, people don't have the skill sets. None of us do um, in every single area uh, to be able to decide what is something that we should actually pay attention to and listen to and what is dangerous or toxic um, or even a foreign directed misinformation and, and propaganda. And the government has a stake. I mean, there's a reason why our newspapers and radios are regulated. I mean, we've seen what happens in Nazi Germany and elsewhere where media can be abused. So we shouldn't be afraid of, of regulation and we shouldn't be afraid of, of social media. Like all technologies, it does good, it can do good and, and can do bad, but we need to, to build a commons um, that is leading us in a positive direction, not tearing us apart. Fascinating. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, so we kind of talked about that, uh, that show unnatural selection right. before this, and I want to get into genetic engineering because this sure. really is the next frontier and there's a whole host of ethical implications. Should we, should we not, where does this lead? What are the downstream, you know, uh, uh, components of this one? But 
I think to that extent is when we see TV shows or when there's media out there like that showing people who are very cavalier in their approach to this science, you know, injecting themselves at a news conference or a guy trying to, (laughs) you know, get his dogs to glow in some backwards, Mm -hmm. you know. So how do we as, how do our listeners really start to separate what the hardcore science says about this genetic, you know, genetic engineering versus what the pseudoscience or even what the genetic celebrities out there are talking about? Yeah. So it's a great question and a really important one. The first is um, everybody, we all need to educate ourselves on these issues. I mean, the reason why I wrote uh, Hacking Darwin like a book, a beach book, a book you can take to the beach, not like a science book, um, is I just wanted people to, to feel that this is the greatest story of all, of all time. I mean, the genetics story is the story of our of our being and becoming and of our past and our future. And it's really fun and interesting and, and exciting. And it has huge positive implications. And like any frontier technology, um, we're going to have all kinds of people with, with different ideas for how it, it, it can be used. And there's a really important role for the people who are the experimenters, the radicals, the frontiers people. I mean, those are the people who are are pushing boundaries. Jana Breslin here. As most of you know, I grew up playing sports which required lots of intensive training. A couple years ago, I switched to CrossFit style workouts and let's just say my body has taken an absolute beating over the years. I remember waking up after heavy workouts, barely being able to get out of bed. I always added fish oil to my daily regimen for overall wellness and to help combat the post-workout muscle soreness, but my joints and muscles would still be sore for days. I needed something more than just omega-3 fish oil. That's why I take complete human PRM response. This daily super supplement helps my body resolve inflammation quickly so I can live pain-free and keep training. I've been taking it for a while now and my workouts are better, my recovery is faster, and overall I just feel great. I know we all need a good omega-3 product and PRM response is the next generation in omega-3 supplementation with unique pre-resolving mediators that help resolve inflammation quickly so we can get back in the game of life. Head on over to store.completehuman.com to try it 20% off with the code PRM20. I think that there's, I want to talk a little bit about some of your other hats that you wear on the science fiction side. And there's this long, incredible history of science fiction really blazing a trail for our understanding of what human beings are capable of. And that usually comes at a cost, right? Good science fiction is kind of, kind of is a cautionary tale. And whether that's artificial intelligence, recognizing that human beings are a threat to the planet and wiping (laughs) us out, whether it's, you know, I, I, we were just talking about mass, I, I, mice. I think of the rats of Nim. Oh, you know, I love that book. Yeah. That's a genetically engineered <laughs> yeah. rodent. Yeah. To be smarter. Right. So, uh, you know, how is it that science fiction, and, and as a huge science fiction fan, been so good at understanding not just the scientific potential, but the ethical implications of that technology, especially as it pertains to genetic engineering? And Michael Crichton's probably one of the yeah. Uh, the great authors in that realm. That's the role of science fiction. I mean, the role of science fiction is to take a germ of an idea and whether it's a technology that hasn't yet matured or a technology that is, that is advancing and say, well, what happens if whatever this technology is matures because it's never linear and we live in this dynamic environment where everything impacts everything else and our whole sense of what it means to be a human. I mean, the fact that I'm doing this, um, this interview from my apartment in New York, um, if my ancestors who were nomads in the savannas of Africa were to come here and just plop down into, into my life, this would be science fiction. Um, and um, so that's the job of science fiction is to say, well, here are different possible futures. And the goal is not just to entertain people to say, all right, well, if If we have these different possibilities, how do we think differently? How do we open our mind um, to what we do and we and we don't want and maybe to inspire us to get a little more engaged and a a little more involved um, in the decision making process? Certainly for me, uh, when I the reason why I write wrote my two sci fi novels, novels, Genesis Code and, and Eternal Sonata, is I was giving all these lectures on the future of genetic engineering and it was interesting to people. But when I explained the story of the genetics revolution as it like a storyteller would, which is how our ancestors shared information, I could just see in people's eyes that they were suddenly getting it. Uh, And that was why I wanted to bring people into the conversation 
through the the experience of uh, of science fiction. And I think that's and I wouldn't put myself at the, in the at the level of H.G. Wells or the Jules Verne or all these these great sci-fi writers, but that's what they do is they they talk about a future um, that's that's one of the possibilities and it brings people into that process. You know, history is always the judge on on. Uh you know, things like that. So H.G. Wells and, you know, wasn't H.G. Wells until later on in life. Yep. Um, so let's talk a little bit about genetic engineering. We've heard so much in the news over the last, you know, couple of years, CRISPR editing, right? And, and right. I think stem cells were really the tip of the, you know, the, you know, the, the medical iceberg. And then that technology almost got leapfrogged, possibly, at least from our perspective, a little bit because of maybe bad policy here in the U.S. George Bush saying, even though it was, a, I think, a well-rounded decision that because of even his religious beliefs that we weren't going to do embryonic stem cell research, a lot of that research goes overseas. And so genetic engineering almost kind of leapfrogged. And now we're having these very real conversations about what CRISPR can do. But I don't think that people really think about that, right? Like what happens when we start saying, well, it's not just, you know, I want a kid with blue eyes, but I want a kid who's got an IQ of 180 and whose muscle density is X, Y, Z. How do we really anticipate what can happen from this? And how do we mitigate the potential blowback that comes from some of these Im very impressive technologies? Because it's happening and it's going yeah. to. Totally. So yeah. I mean, what are the implications? It's, it's overwhelming to think about that. Yeah. No, no. So first going backwards, the issue of, of, uh, of regulation and the restrictions that, that, uh, pres that uh, President George uh, W. Bush uh, placed on stem cell research. I wasn't a supporter of those restrictions. I certainly don't think it was um, a, a good idea, but absolutely it's a good idea for us to, as a, as a society, um, to weigh the, the potential benefits and the risks of any technology and use that risk benefit analysis to, to find uh, the, the best way forward. And we're in that moment now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a member of the World Health Organization International Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing. And that's what we're doing is trying to think about, about how do we build a governance framework that optimizes the benefits. And this is a huge story of benefit. I mean, that, that we, the, we are going to unlock technologies that cure all kinds of cancers and other diseases that help us live healthier, longer, more robust lives. And we should want that. I mean, every time a person dies from some terrible disease or gets Alzheimer, it's, Alzheimer's, it's just a waste of, of human potential. But um, we know that these technologies are going to continually grow and expand over time. And we know that being a human is not a fixed target, um, that we've only been homo sapiens for around 300,000 years. Over the past nearly 4 billion years, we've evolved from single cell organisms into this. And this was never, this being homo sapien was never the, the terminus of our evolutionary journey. Um, and so just as it would be wrong to say, well, let's just do anything and everything and use um, genetic, the incredibly powerful tools of genetic engineering willy nilly, it would also be wrong uh, to say that we should not do any of it, that we, we shouldn't, as a matter of fact, we, we shouldn't, um, to the best of our abilities, speed up the science for positive uses while we develop the kind of infrastructure that will help us have that, that cost benefit analysis that we recognize is set within the context of our cultures and will change over time. And that seems fundamentally at odds with a lot of religious doctrine out there. And I, and I actually think of Jehovah's Witness, I believe it's, you, know, you can't get a blood transfusion, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we start talking about, I'm a Jehovah's Witness and I've got sickle cell, I've got Alzheimer's, and there's a very real technology that gets rid of that. Like, how does that actually, in your experience, line up with a lot of this religious doctrine out there? So it was interesting. Last year, I was invited to speak at the Vatican, and I went and I met these really amazing people, cardinals and others. And afterwards, I was really surprised that they commissioned from me a, an article on uh, human genetic engineering. And I wrote a very, very honest article. Um, and, and in it for them, and in it, I, I said, um, look, here's this technology. It's tricky because yes, it's true um, that in, with some of these technologies, if you believe that life begins at uh, conception, some of the research 
um, is research on early stage pre-implanted embryos. Or if you're selecting an embryo uh, in, during uh, af, uh, in vitro fertilization, um, you're selecting one and you're not selecting another. But those kinds of absolute positions need to be weighed against the benefits of those kinds of interventions, which includes saving lots of people's lives, reducing a huge amount of, of suffering. And the Catholic Church today is not the same Catholic Church uh, that it's always been. I mean, the, the Catholic Church was the advocate of these incredibly murderous crusades and the Inquisition, and they've evolved. Anyway, I was really surprised um, that they published the article and that, that they have fostered this kind of, uh, uh, of debate. And so I feel like if the Catholic Church, particularly under Pope Francis, is open to at least having the conversation, that's a, that's a positive sign. We may have a, a similar conversation in the United States uh, now with the, uh, with the COVID uh, vaccine. It's one thing uh, when people are saying, well, they don't wanna vaccinate their kids uh, to measles or, or something else when there's herd immunity around them. Um, if you aren't going to vaccinate and you're going to you know, kill your grandmother, uh, that's a tougher decision because the consequences are going to be much more uh, apparent. So these kinds of, of decisions and these, even these kinds of, of religious decisions happen within the context of our societies. And that context is always growing and changing. It's a challenge, right? And I, I think that there's this, there's this perception that from a scientific perspective, we've evolved beyond where we're at right now, but there is that deadlock between, shall we say, religious, pol you know, the religion and the politics, you know, butting up against the science. And, and I think to that extent, I mean, you know, let's take COVID as a perfect example. We have the potential to, to get rid of this in theory, but there is a lot of pushback, uh, you know, and, and it's, is it, is it the news, you know, just trying to sell advertising rates? Is it politics, making sure that we're safe? Is it, you know, so it, it, we, we seem to live in this polarized society where science is always up right. against the wall of other people's perceptions. And I know that you've done such amazing work on that, but how do, how do people go about getting the right information so that they can be informed when it comes to very real things like vaccinations or yeah. stem cells or genetic engineering? Right. So first, Besides I think there's this podcast. Okay. Yeah, of course. So for this, there's a really important point. And is we can't also we can't fall into the opposite trap of that science is good and people who are suspicious of science are bad. I mean, we are moving very even with the case of vaccines. I mean, this is the by far fastest vaccine ever developed in, in human history. It's going in to not just human trials, but now with uh, approval in the in the UK and soon in the United States into human use um, with very, very little data relative to, uh, to earlier vaccines. And so um, I definitely think that there's a reason for people to be a little cautious. There's an even greater reason um, for people to get vaccinated um, because we have, you know, we have good regulatory agencies and because the, the threat of COVID both individually and collectively is, uh, is pretty huge. So I, I do think that those of us in the science community, we have a, a real obligation to be honest. Um, we can't just say that, for example, with, in the context of, um, uh, of the COVID vaccine, this is 100% good, no risk, everybody should do it because there, there will be risk uh, that if, you, if we go to a relatively less tested vaccine and, and very uh, quickly uh, vaccinate billions of people all at once, all around the world, there, there will be a small number of unintended consequences. And so we can't be selling a, a, false, uh, a false story. That's, that's really important. Well, and and I, then, I think of yeah. thalidomide from the, you know, it's yeah. concept, sure. right? it's like, you know, what are the unintended consequences? Even though we perceived it was safe, it was the next generation that paid the price for that. Yep. Yep. And so, so I think that level of, of honesty and just saying there are things that we don't know. But the second thing is we need a mass, as I was saying earlier, a mass education uh, process. That means um, that everybody who everybody plays a role. I gave the keynote speech uh, this year to the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, the fertility doctors and endocrinologists and fertility nurses and, and others. And that was what I, I said is you thought you were in the fertility business, but in fact, you're in the public information and education business. And that's why 
podcasts like this, people coming from the health and wellness angle, uh, doctors, nurses, really everybody, scientists, we all need to be part of the public education process because we've entered into a democratic age. It's connected to your question about, about social media. And so regular people have become the deciders. Um, and so we need to apply a lot of energy to bringing people, uh, not just education, but engagement and empowerment so that we can make um, to the best of our abilities, smart collective decisions. I look forward to when that happens. It's a process. I mean, it's, it's not going to happen at once, but the goal is every day to move a little bit in that, uh, in that direction. So uh, that, I love that idea, right? And part of the complete human mission is probably very much in line with what you talk about, especially on, on the one world concept is, you know, how do we, how do we fix a lot of the fundamental problems? And it's, it's not with home runs every single day. It's mm -hmm. the small base hits, but what do you give our listeners some, just some concrete pieces of advice, right? Like these are things that you can go out today to do, to better educate yourself, uh, you know, to, to prepare for the next phase of our evolution, to prepare our world for, you know, hopefully a longevity that goes well past where we're headed yeah. towards with a lot of the problems that we're facing. Yeah. So there are a few things. One is to educate yourself. There are lots of great books, lots of great websites, certainly my book, Hacking Darwin, but there are, there are lots of them. If you have views, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm a member of the World Health Organization uh, Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing. We have a web portal seeking views. If you want to benefit from the, the technology of extending healthy human lifespan in the future, um, you better be doing the things that you guys are advocating for now, which is um, sleeping well, exercising, um, having a healthy diet, having a positive attitude, all those blue zone kinds of, uh, of things. Um, if, if we were to turn those into a pill, people would attack their pharmacies to get it but it turns out they're all free and people don't, uh, and people don't do it. And so I, I just think we need to think of these interventions really at every level. On the personal level, there are all, all kinds of things that you can do. Uh, getting involved politically. Uh, in Hacking Darwin, I have a political guide of questions people can ask their elected officials and government officials. Um, ask those questions. I mean, we need to hold ourselves accountable. We need to hold our leaders uh, accountable. Um, and we need to recognize that our sense of uh, our time sense of change is off uh, because in, in, when things are changing exponentially, uh, your, our sense of the rate of change looking in the rearview mirror is too conservative because the rate of change is accelerating. And I, and I think we talk a lot about that on as far as climate change is like the time to act isn't 10, 15, 20 years from now. The time to act is 10, 15, 20 years ago. And right. so we're in a massive deficit to undo some of these catastrophic problems. So yep. it's, we need radical thinking and we need radical action. And, and part of that is, is allowing science to have the same voice that it once did versus being, you know, like, I, I don't know if politics really has a place in that. And I'd love to get your opinion in the sense of how does, how does politics shape climate, uh, you know, policy when you've got politicians denouncing what, pretty much every scientist in the world says is a fact. Our society is changing. A um, hundred years ago, only 20% of the global uh, population was literate. Uh, now we have 85% literacy in globally and, and higher than that here in, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, people are engaged uh, politically in, uh, in, in new ways. And so there certainly was a time, and you think of World War II and the Manhattan Project, where there was just a relatively small number of people were making pretty monumental decisions for themselves and for, frankly, for, for all, of, uh, all of humanity. And now we're in a different world um, where we don't have that. And, uh, and so because everything in life has become politicized, science also has become politicized. Um, and there, are, there is some um, ideology that's built into science. I think it's wrong for us to, to think that science is just exists in and of itself uh, outside of our, of our societal frameworks. Um, but if we are a society where ideology drives everything, and we can look at examples, whether it's the, the former Soviet Union, um, where they had the biology had to be approved by the state. So they had all these kind of wacky ideas. And if somebody was 
had alternative ideas, they were in trouble or purged or um, whatever. Uh, the same is, is true in all kinds of authoritarian states where ideology comes first. And we, we can't be that. The scientific process needs to be driven by trying to find right answers. I mean, there are um, riddles uh, to be solved, understanding the complexity of, of biology. Um, but then how we apply these lessons, that exists within a social context. And again, um, that's, all of our, uh, that's all of our business. Um, and so this requires a level, we keep using the, the word maturity, a <laughs> level of, of maturity. But there are some societies that are actually doing a pretty great job. I mean, Denmark, for example, has a very structured process for engaging the general public in conversations about really complex scientific and other issues, and then weaving those insights into the policy process. I think that's, we're going to need those kinds of, of structures uh, here as well. And, and that can happen on an organized government level, but people can, can do that on their own as well through whatever, community groups, faith groups, book clubs, all sorts of things. Nonprofits. Nonprofits. Mm -hmm. One, uh, um, thank you for that too. And, and I, I think we certainly want to highlight your nonprofit, not just in the show notes, but uh, you know, talk a little bit about that. Um, but I, I want, before we get into that and really kind of focus on really some of the concrete work you're doing for the planet, we wrote an article a while ago um, that was based off of a, a scientific article where a scientist said that the first person to live to be a thousand years old has already been born. Is Aubrey? Uh, Aubrey de Grey? Yes, it was. Yeah, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that this was one of those hyperbole type of scientific articles, and it really talked about genetic engineering, but I, I want right. to talk about the uh, kind of the responsibility that we have in developing the maturity to recognize that, okay, like with genetic engineering, with stem cells, we can drastically extend the human lifespan, but what does that do to a planet? Population density, um, you know, the ability for viruses to spread exponentially like they are now. So what are your thoughts on that? From a scientific perspective, like, are we on the road to a more utopian type of future or kind of in the science fiction world, are we on the road to, you know, the zombie apocalypse? <laughs> yeah. So a few questions um, woven into that. First is on the science of, of human life extension. I mean, how we've come... Uh, in the United States, uh, 100 years ago, or a little more than 100 years ago, average life expectancy was 40. Uh, today, it's almost uh, 80. So that's a huge, huge progress. And I think that it will be possible to continue to just chip away uh, at healthy human lifespan, particularly average human lifespan, because there are lots of people who are not living up to their, um, their genetic possibility of how long they could live, whether it's because of uh, lifestyle or environment or, 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 or so many other things. Um, we know that the oldest woman who's ever lived, the oldest uh, human um, lived to be 122. Would it be possible for humans to live healthily uh, to 123? I think so, probably. That's never happened. Um, and we're, we're not gonna get there in one step, um, but there's a lot of flexibility in biology, I mean, closely related animals. We have clams. Um, some clams live to 40 and other uh, varieties of clams live to be over 500. Um, so we have sharks that live many hundreds of uh, hundreds of years. And so I do think it will be possible to continually chip away um, at uh, extending healthy human lifespan. Do I think that um, the first person who will live uh, to be a thousand in their in this biological form um, has been already born? No. As a matter of fact, I would bet, I would bet a lot that that, is, that, that hasn't happened. Um, but there are lots of forms of, of immortality. It may not be exactly in this, in this format. It, it, it could be some little piece of us or some avatar that reflects something of us that's more of us than just our, our, sprinkled, our, our sprinkled ashes. And then that leads to your, your other question is, well, what happens when we decrease mortality rates. And we're seeing it now uh, that we have you know, lots of more people are surviving um, past their uh, infanthood uh, than uh, has happened in, uh, in the past. And that's happening uh, all around the world. Um, but I do think though, that as we extend healthcare and, and health span, 
um, that we're going to see uh, increases in productivity and innovation and all these kinds of, of things. So I, I absolutely think um, that this planet can support 10 billion people, um, but it can't support them if everybody lives like the average American. So as we grow, we're going to have to think of new ways of um, living in harmony with the, the um, environment around us rather than trying to, to um, fight it to submission. Do you think in, at, one, at a certain point in the future, everyone will have some degree of genetic modification? Well, I mean, think of where we are now. Um, our ancestors would have thought um, that immunizations that we just take completely for granted are a superpower. I mean, it was almost a magical superpower and we already have that built in. We all, a lot of us have our technology already built into our bodies through pacemakers and, and cochlear implants and, and all of these kinds of things. As I write about in, in Hacking Darwin, I definitely think that we're moving in the direction of a world um, where more and more of us um, are born um, through the interaction of biology and science, uh, particularly using uh, embryo uh, in vitro fertilization and, and embryo screening. Uh, right now we have, as, as far as we know, three human beings on earth um, who are genetically modified using CRISPR, the, the three so-called CRISPR babies in, in China. Um, but there will be more and more um, uh, babies in the future who will be born um, using genetic modification and, and it won't be huge modifications at least in the near term, um, but that's going to increase. And the reason that, that that is going to increase is that biology is buggy by nature. We talk about a random mutation and natural selection, the, the kind of foundations are of Darwinian evolution. It basically means that every time there's any kind of offspring, it's a little bit different um, from their parents. And that's why um, we have some mutations um, and some variances that create um, uh, some kind of advantage others that create a disadvantage and, and lots of them that are, uh, that are neutral. And we're going to, and, but because of that, the downside is there are some of these mutations that in the context of our environment as it exists today um, can be very deadly. And we call those cancers and genetic diseases and, and things like that. And so if we can apply our science um, to address or eliminate deadly genetic disorders, we're going to do it. And if we can apply our science to make us more capable over time of living in different environments um, that we're not so in this version um, set up for, like living in space, we're going to do it. And we'll have to do it because we know that our planet is, is going away. Uh, and we know that just, you know, we, our species, we are designed to live on the surface of this planet within a specific temperature range. If, if those variables change, we're going to have to change. And if, we, if you believe in the survivability of humans, as I do, then we should do it and we have to start somewhere. But again, that doesn't mean we just go at it willy nilly, it doesn't mean anything goes, it means we need to have a process. Mm -hmm. So do you believe uh, you know, that within our lifetime that we'll see people on Mars living there? Um, I don't know. So I guess the, the question is, will there be humans on Mars in our lifetime? I think it's, it's, I think it's quite possible. Um, but um, we're going to have to, right now, we don't have the technology to do it. We don't have uh, the full life support systems. Um, but I, but I, think it's a, I think it's a realistic goal for us uh, to get there. And I think, I think it, it probably is achievable, um, but it's not like when President Kennedy said, we're going to the moon, where pretty much all the science was there. I mean, we're going to have to invent new technologies, um, but given the rate of technological progress, I think that that seems achievable. I well, think it was this morning, a news article that came out that, or Elon Musk said it, it, within six years, humans will be on Mars. I think that was just today, actually. Yeah, but let's let's acknowledge that Elon Musk says a lot of things that turn out to not be <laughs> yeah, yeah. 100% yeah. accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't think that it's true. I don't think we'll get there in six years, but like I was talking about frontiers people, we need people like Elon Musk who mm -hmm. are kind of are helping us see Shoot for the stars, for, see across the, the horizons. Yeah. Um, and we need scientists uh, to help uh, figure out, well, how do we build the technology? 
And we need ethicists and regular people who are weighing the costs and, and benefits of things that we could do versus what we should do, um, what we should spend our resources on, how should we should allocate our energy. And that's, that's why you know, all of these, these um, issues are really need to be part of a public engagement process. Well, and it's funny, I think there was Bill Nye who really, you know, critiqued Elon Musk or, you know, the whole Mars project is like, we can't take care of this planet. Why are we going to go destroy another one? Um, but uh, so let's let's use that as a segue into some of the, you know, the nonprofit that work that you do. But I, I want to ask you, like, what is the biggest in your mind problem that we face as a species right now um, in, in as it pertains to our survival? Yeah, so it, it's a good segue in, into one shared world. I, I think the biggest one, the macro problem, is that our species has relatively rapidly, at least in the, in historical terms, gone from a bunch of small groups of roving nomads to this global species um, with the technology and the power to fundamentally change or even end all of life on Earth. Um, but while we've jumped from the, the community building of the little uh, nomadic band to the village, to the city, to the country, um, with this, this exception of the relatively weak international system like the UN, we don't have a, a collective way for addressing and solving global problems. And that's why all of our global challenges, including pandemics, climate change, ecosystem destruction, global systemic poverty and, and inequality, and so many others remain unaddressed because our political organization um, pretty much ends at the national level. And so that's what creates this, this global collective action problem that's incredibly dangerous. And then there are the manifestations of that. And that is that we have this runaway nuclear arms race, that we are entering the age of synthetic biology and we don't have a global public health or global health infrastructure that's capable of, uh, of meeting this, uh, this challenge. But in my view, those are all manifestations of this, uh, this bigger problem. And if we um, only address the manifestations and not the bigger problem, we'll continually be jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. So have you outlined in research and publication um, and, and all the work that you've done a path forward to really create some kind of unifying body that would address a lot of these problems on the foundational level? So um, it's a really, really great question um, because so certainly in one shared world, uh, we've drafted our Declaration of Interdependence, which has been translated into 19 languages. And now we have millions of people on our, in our, uh, our global events. Um, and so because of that, I'm, a lot of people are reaching out to me who are part of these world government communities that frankly have been around for many, many decades, and, and they've developed all of these infrastructures for what a, a single world government would look like. And I, I tell them uh, that I'm, a, I'm personally against world government. I mean, it took a world war uh, to, to um, catalyze our sense of, um, in 1648, at the end of the Thirty Years' War, this new model of, of state sovereignty. It took two world wars to push um, and world leaders to create the, the United Nations. And I don't think um, that our world that's organized by countries is about to, that the countries are just gonna say, all right, fine, let's create some kind of world government and how does it work? And, and will we be even safer with that than the world that, that we have? And so what I tell people is I, rather than um, trying to create this, what I see as almost uh, right now, impossible thing, why don't we learn from the virus? The reason the virus is so successful is that it has its core message. A virus is just a little bit of, inf of information that gets incorporated into the host. Doesn't The smart viruses like uh, SARS-CoV-2, they don't kill the host, they just change the host's behavior. And so for us, what we're trying to do is to insert that little bit of, of information, the idea of adapting our global framework um, to better reflect the mutual responsibilities of our deep global interdependence so that every government, every business, every civil society organization just does a better job of balancing its own narrow interests to its citizens or constituents or, uh, or whomever else 
and its broader interest representing our common interest as humans sharing the same, the, the same planet. Because if we compete with each other in this, with this zero sum attitude um, and nobody looks out for the commons, we're all going to be worse off. So you basically want to be a knowledge protein spike. Exactly. Well, not a spike. We, we <laughs> want it to be just kind of an ongoing, um, sustained, healthy, just like, just like you guys with diet. Um, you don't want to kind of go and, and binge on, on kale and, and quinoa and mushrooms. What you want to do is to say, well, how can we change the diet? How can we change the conversation? And over time, then a lot of other things can change. And so I, I think that's, that, in my mind, is the more sustainable model. I like that. And I actually think, you know, I think the challenge is, is right now we face some of these major problems and we want these like final solutions to all these things, but it doesn't work that way because with each solution comes a new problem that we have to right. tackle. And, and mm -hmm. I don't think right. that we're equipped for that, but I love the optimism and I love the approach to it. It's, it's education is everything. So where do things go from here, right? We've got all of this technology that we're playing with. It's exponential we've got climate change, we've got plastics in the ocean, we've got all of these problems, we've got political strife. So how, what does the next five years look like for you? Like, what do you want yeah. to accomplish in, in your, um, in everything that you've got going on? So I'm actually quite optimistic. I, I really hope that this pandemic has shown us our greatest vulnerabilities on a US national, national level, it's shown us how vulnerable we are to people pitting us one against the other. It's shown us um, what happens and when we don't have a mature conversation about the role of, of science in our lives. It's shown us uh, what happens if we alienate our, our, our allies um, and don't take, to, don't take the world and life, um, and life seriously. But it's also shown us that there's a lot of hope, um, that it's incredible that we've come together to create not just viruses so quickly, um, but to bring political change, to raise, uh, to raise issues. Um, and this is, it's a wake up call. And the question for us is, can we wake up? And so for me personally, I have a lot of things that I'm really excited about. One is um, building one shared world. And what we're doing is we wanna build a, a fully empowered global interdependence movement to create a language that everybody who's working on any one of these, uh, of these big global issues like climate change, pandemics, weapons of mass destruction, systemic poverty and inequality, that they have a framework that connects their issue to everybody else's issues. And that's, that's really, uh, really important. Certainly in my science education work within we're, we have our World Health Organization report that's going to come out uh, next year um, through my uh, other writing and media. I really want what, I, what I'm calling for is a species wide dialogue on the future of human genetic engineering. It's another one of these kind of big, crazy ideas, um, but I think it's really important and I think it's really, uh, really exciting. And, and I, what I'd like to do is to be part of that process and in my own little way, lead a, a process bringing people together to solve our world's biggest problems because I have, I have tremendous faith about what's possible. I'm the, the son of a refugee and certainly in my family history coming from really dark, terrible days and then you kind of seeds get replanted and then there's always hope, um, but it's, these things don't happen on their own. We have to build them through our own actions through sharing, through building coalitions. And that's what I'm hoping to do. I love that. I, love I, that I think that, uh, yeah, there's so many people with the knowledge base that you have that could kind of steer in the opposite direction. They could look at things in a more apocalyptic way. And, you know, we've had conversations with, with people like that who have the knowledge and, and everything at their fingertips. And, and I think so much of it boils down to attitude. It's what yeah. do we believe we are capable of? Yeah. And, and, and in some ways it can become self-fulfilling. I mean, certainly there's a role for pessimism. There's a role for fear. There's a role for anxiety. If everybody was just, uh, you know, a, a bleary eyed optimist, I'm sure the, every plane would crash and, and nothing would, would, <laughs> would work. But we, we need to do is, is, is build an ecosystem based around hope and possibility, but that's also, that also recognizes that there are all kinds of problems that need to be addressed, um, that uh, there are all kinds of perspectives that need to be brought into the process 
uh, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because we can get better, uh, better outcomes. Absolutely. Jamie, how do people get involved with you? Oh, great. Um, so first, if they want to find out about uh, my work on hacking Darwin and genetics and WHO, um, they can go to either my personal website, jamiemetzl.com, J-A-M-I-E-M-E-T-Z-L.com, or the hackingdarwin.com uh, website. And if they'd like, which I hope they will, uh, to get involved with One Shared World, uh, they can go to the oneshared.world website. They can sign the Pledge of Interdependence. They can join our campaign uh, calling on world leaders to guarantee safe, uh, clean water and basic sanitation and, uh, and hygiene to everyone on earth by, uh, by 2030. So I'm, I'm easily findable and on Twitter at Jamie Metzl. Wonderful. Love it. Well, this is just a wealth of information. So many topics. So thank you so much for sharing all this with us. My great pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, we just got to spend the last hour with Jamie Metzl. Um, I think on this show, we've, we've highlighted so many of the problems that we face as a species, and, and whether that's political, whether that's medical, whether that's climate. Um, and very rarely do we have someone on the show who brings such a wealth of information as well as a solution base. Uh, I think unlike anything else that we've done, and, and part of that is the education, part of that is kind of a return to human decency and recognizing that humanity has to trump uh, for lack of a better word, the, uh, you know, um, all of the other I implements that we have in place. And, and so, you know, we couldn't have been more excited to spend the last hour with Jamie Metzl. All of his information will be in the show notes. Follow him at One World. Uh, actually, one Shared World. One Shared World. That's a tough one. Uh, one Shared World. And then, um, you know, get involved, uh, get excited and, and, you know, follow this guy on the science fiction as well as the fiction side, because very rarely do you find someone who's good at both. And I, and I think we have been uh, fortunate enough to see that here with Jamie Metzl. Thank you, Jamie. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. So much.